We're going to go back in time to start. Uh, August 22nd, 1851, Commodore John Stevens and his six-man crew won the America's Cup. And if you don't know what the America's Cup is, neither did I. Uh, it is a 53-mile yacht race. So if you're not into yacht racing, I can see why you wouldn't know that. Uh, it's reported that Queen Victoria witnessed the race and asked Stevens after the race who came in second place, to which he famously replied, Ah, your majesty, there is no second, which is the 1851 version of Ricky Bobby. <laughs> if you're not first, you're last, right? <laughs> A little more classy. Uh, now, listen to this. The New York Yacht Club, which Stevens was a part of, went on to win the America's Cup for the next 132 years in a row. 132-year win streak. And the Browns have never won a Super Bowl. <laughs> so we don't, we, we don't know what that's like, right? It wasn't until September of 1983 but the Australia two, skippered by uh, John Bertrand, finally broke their win streak. He won by 41 seconds. Two observations as I read this story this week. Um, one, as I was reading the story, couldn't help but realize how ridiculous the word yacht is spelled. Have you ever seen this? Y-A-C-H-T, yacht? What is that? Why do we pronounce it yacht? Only a pretentious rich person would pronounce a word like that. Not an important observation. The second one is, though... Um, if the New York Yacht Club won 132 years in a row, that means everyone else lost 132 years in a row. So here's a question. How do you break a 132-year losing streak? How do you do that? When, when losing is what you're used to, when losing is like in your DNA, when losing is like all you know, that's all you know. How did the Australia 2 break such a horrible losing streak? Well, uh, several years before 1983, the skipper of the Australia 2 made a fake audio recording of the race with a narration and sound effects, water splashing, yachts ripping through the water, all that, where the Australia 2 won the race. A fake recording with it, and they've never heard anything like this for not 132 years. The New York Yacht Club won all those, never heard anything like it. So he makes this fake recording. He makes a bunch of copies of it and he gives it to the crew members and he tells them, listen to this twice a day. So they did. For three years, they listened to this fake recording of them winning the race. So before they win in 1983 and break a 132 year losing streak, they listened to a recording of them winning it 2,190 times. They had visualized winning 2,190 times before they actually won. So the question, how do you break a 132-year losing streak? Two parts. One, you have to have a vision for what winning looks like. You gotta have a vision for it. You've never experienced it before. All you've ever experienced at best was second place, so you have to have a vision for what winning actually looks like. And then two, you have to believe that it's possible. You have to believe that if you've never experienced it, it's hard to believe that because again, the best you've ever done is second place. You might have uh, put your, your own limitation on that and say the best we can, we can hope for is second place. No, you have to believe that winning is possible. So I believe those principles work for uh, a yacht club and they also work in your life. If you're stuck in life, you have to have a vision for what unstuck looks like and believe that that's possible. If you're hurting, you have to have a vision for what not hurting looks like. And you have to believe that healing's possible. If you're in a rut and you've just been stuck in this one thing, you have to have a vision of what popping out looks like and, and freedom looks like. You've got to believe that it's possible. If you're on a wicked, wicked losing streak in life, you got to have a vision for what winning looks like. You got to see it, feel it, taste it, and believe that it's possible. So, we're starting a series today called Sound Mind. We're looking at mental health. Um, I don't think I have to convince you that this is 
an important topic. Uh, pretty much everybody understands that now. Um, but uh, 2020, believe it or not, which is almost five years ago now, in 2020, uh, all of the mental health statistics went haywire. Uh, anxiety and depression jumped like 25%, loneliness went up, suicide rates went up. The numbers say that mental health got worse about five years ago and stayed worse. Nothing, nothing got better. Uh, so as a society, as a world, we're struggling with this. But, I don't know. I don't know what effect statistics have on you. Any more statistics kind of go in one ear out the other with me. So I, maybe a better question for you would be like, well, well how's, how's your mental health? That's a weird question, isn't it? It's only appropriate because I'm up here and you're, you're there. Like, if, the, if I asked you that in the lobby, it'd be real weird, right? That's like an intrusive question, right? Like, hey, so how's your mental health going? <laughs> Coffee's good. Stay out of my business, right? Like, what are you, why are you up in my business? Uh, so think about this. How would you answer that? Not easy, right? I mean, you might, you might in your initial reaction, might be, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't think about it that much. I don't, I don't know. Maybe you're afraid to think about it too much. You're afraid of what the answer actually might be. Maybe, maybe you would answer in such a way where you're like, well, things are going pretty good right now, so my mental health's pretty good. But you gotta know when you say it like that, you're kind of telling on yourself because what you mean is that your mental uh, health is tied to your circumstances. So when they go down, you're not gonna feel great. And then when they go back up, you'll feel great. So you're actually just gonna ride the wave of circumstances in your life. Or maybe you know that you're on a losing streak mentally. Um, your mental health isn't good, hasn't been good for a long time. Maybe not 132 years yet, uh, not quite that bad, but you feel like your mental health has been off for a while. Maybe like long enough to wherever your state is, you feel like that's what it's always gonna be. You feel stuck in a negative mental state. You feel like your thoughts are in ruts. You go to the same places, think the same thoughts, feel the same feelings, and that's just the way it is now. So the question is, how do you break free? How can you win mentally? How can you go to a place where if somebody asks you the super awkward question, hey, how's your mental health? Where you would answer in a positive way. How can you get there? Well, I believe that the answer uh, is actually similar to the answer for how a yacht club could break a 132-year win streak. I think, one, you need to have a, a vision for what your mental health could look like, a vision of what could be, and you need to believe that it's possible. You need to believe that it's possible. Now, when I say a vision of what your mental health could look like, I mean something a little different than like a fake recording of a yacht race. You could maybe do a fake recording, but that would be a little weird. Um, when I say a vision of what your mental health could look like, I mean like a God-inspired, compelling, enthralling, draw your heart like a magnet to it, picture of a possible future. You need to see past what is to what could be. You need to see past what is to what could be. And then you need to believe that that picture is possible. Now, that's difficult, right? To have vision, uh, really, to be able to see past what is is hard enough as it is. And then to see what could be. To allow your mind to go to a place to imagine what mental health could actually look like. That's a difficult task. A difficult task. So the place where I think you can get this vision is in the Bible. Uh, I think the Bible gives us some pictures of what a, a positive mental health picture looks like. And what we're going to do today, we're going to look at two verses, just two. There's like 31,000 some verses in the Bible. We're only going to look at two. This is easy, right? This is easy. We're just doing two verses. Who couldn't do two verses? They're good, right? Yeah, you're not convinced. All right. Um, two verses, a vision of your mental health. Here's the first one, 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Whew. That's a short little verse. There's a lot there, isn't it? That one packs a punch. So he gives us here one thing that God has not given us and three things that God has given us. 
right? One thing that he's not given is trying to say, no, 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 not that. Instead, these three things. Now, before we jump into the details of that, I just want to say that um, this is the Apostle Paul writing a letter to a guy named Timothy. And it's, it's, uh, it's written to a Christian. And that's actually important. So Timothy is a Christian. He has uh, put his faith and trust in Jesus. And the reason this is important is because we believe that when you become a Christian, like the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. And that means some stuff inside of you. So there's some promises attached to this verse that, that specifically apply to Christians, that God has given someone who is a believer uh, these things and, and not these other things. Uh, so if you're not a Christian yet, I, I, and you, maybe you would ask the question, like, why would I want to become a Christian? I would say a lot of things to you, but one of the things I would say is like, hey, look at this verse. Here's, here's a part of the offer of, of being a follower of Jesus. Not a spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. That's the thing that God is offering uh, so if you are a Christian, the first thing you need to see is that a spirit of fear is not from God. A spirit of fear is not from God. Now, let me clarify. If you're like in your backyard playing with your kids and a bear walks out of the woods, <laughs> fear is the proper response there, right? Please don't do the weird Christian thing where you're like, no, it's fine. Jesus loves you, Mr. Bear. Like, don't do that. <laughs> Jesus might love the bear. The bear's still going to eat you. It's not going to change anything, right? It's not going to change anything. Uh, feeling a feeling in the appropriate time to feel a feeling is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. It didn't say fear. It said a spirit of fear, right? That's a little different. A spirit of fear is, is something other than just feeling fear when in a, in a fearful situation. A spirit of fear. It's like a fear that haunts you a little bit, a fear that follows you around, a fear that feels like a fog, prevents you from seeing properly, kind of clings to you a little bit, feels like you inhale it with every breath. It affects everything. That's not from God. If you have fear when, in times when there's no reason to feel fear, that's not from God. That's not from God. That's what he says. It's not from God. Now, the word also, it's not just this, uh, you know, there's a bear kind of a thing. It's not, the, it's not just that. This word that's used here in the Greek, it's the only place that this word's used in the entire Bible, actually. There's other words for fear that are used. This word is unique. And this word also carries the idea of uncertainty. It's not just fear. It's also this, this hesitancy with life. So Paul's writing it to this young pastor and he's like, hey, you got this spirit where every decision you make, you're second guessing it 45 times. Every time you're about to make a decision, you're like, should I do this or should I do this? And you kind of torture yourself in that. He's like, that's not from God. That's not from God. A constant feeling of timidity and uncertainty and hesitancy. That's not the life God wants for you. Now, there are seasons. There, I'm not saying if you hit a crossroads in your life, you're like, I don't know which one to go. Like, that's going to happen. Again, it's a spirit of that. It's this, your whole life feels this way. That's not from God. Now, remember, we're trying to catch a vision for your mental health. We're trying to catch a vision for your mental health. And what this means is, when we're, when we're looking at this stuff, what, what you're supposed to be doing is like, man, wouldn't that be awesome? What you're not supposed to be doing is going, I suck. I'm not that. It's not me. Listen, you can't do that. When we're trying to have a vision, what, what you need to do is get excited about what could be. Don't, don't dis get depressed about what is, okay? Be drawn to this. Because inherently in a vision, a vision means you're not there yet. And that's okay. You're, you're allowed to not be there yet. So this is, we're not going to not talk about what could be just because it'll make you sad about what is. No, we're going we're gonna to present this as a picture of a possible future. So the first thing that we're painting in this picture of a possible future is spirit of fear is gone in your life. You don't have that anymore. And I want you to like imagine what that would be like. Imagine being free of that cloud where it wouldn't feel like your clothes are saturated with being hesitant on everything, where your thoughts are not haunted by nerves all the time, where the aura, the spirit of fear doesn't follow you, doesn't rule you. Man, can you imagine what that would be like? Imagine not having that, living your life in a, in a bold way. 
minus fear? What would your life be like? What would your relationships be like? So that's the first thing Paul's trying to paint this picture. Not a spirit of fear. But what has God given us? And he gives us three things. A spirit of power. Power. Man, that's huge. God gave you, if you're a Christian, God gave you a spirit of power. I wonder if part of the problem you have mentally is this feeling of powerlessness, helplessness, weakness. You ever get that feeling like if, if like life is like a, a swimming race and everybody else is swimming and you're like, man, I'm not, I'm not even swimming. I'm just like treading water right now. Matter of fact, barely because the water level kind of keeps doing this to me and like everybody else seems to be zooming past and I'm just trying to keep my nose above the water. Or do you feel like, like life is really heavy and you can't, you, you're not strong enough to lift it or life is really big and you just feel too small? Like the energy it takes to just live, you feel like you're never able to give your best self to anything. That, all that, is the opposite of what Paul's saying here in 2 Timothy 1, 7. Power, power. You're given a spirit of power. It's the, the Greek word dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite from. That's, that's supposed to be here. That's waking up in the morning and saying, this is the day the Lord has made. That's waking up in the morning and saying, all right, King Jesus, what do you got for me today? Let's go. And that's, that's swimming. That's not just swimming. That's, uh, you know, I'm not treading water anymore. We're making progress. Matter of fact, I'm going to help other people. That's, that's how much God has given me power, power. Yes, life is heavy. No one's saying life's not heavy. If you're a lifter, though, you know if you ever lift weights, um, heavy, heavy weight when you move it is such a good feeling. My favorite is the bench press. I'm, I'm that kind of a bro. Like I love, man, Monday morning bench press is the time you're supposed to, it's God-ordained time to do chest. And uh, so tomorrow morning, and, and if you get underneath a heavy weight, but you know it's gonna move, oh, such a good feeling. Yes, it's heavy, but the weight is moving. That's the way this is supposed to feel. Yes, life is heavy, but, but you're able to do it power. There's a confidence in that. And where that confidence comes from is not in and of yourself. That confidence comes from knowing that God is with you, that God is working through you. This is not a self-confidence. This is a God confidence. The power comes from him. The power comes from knowing that he's with you, knowing that he's for you, knowing that he's going to work through you. Waking up with that, that you know you could take anything that comes your way. Power, power. And again, this doesn't mean you're not gonna have moments of weakness. I'm not proposing some weird Christian who never has feelings or emotions or never goes up and down in any way. Like you're gonna have moments of weakness. You might even have seasons of weakness. But this means that if you like had to pick a color with which to paint your life, one of the pieces of that color is gonna be power. And that's gonna be the overall thing that you see, power. Somebody's describing your life, mm, power. So, man, can you imagine? So again, this is a vision. You're supposed to be like, oh, wouldn't this be awesome? Can you imagine somebody asking you that weird question, how's your mental health? And you being able to say, hmm, feeling really powerful lately. Wouldn't that be, a, that'd be weird? I would, the question and the answer would both be weird. <laughs> but wouldn't it be cool? You wouldn't say it because you have way too much self-awareness to be weird like that. But if you didn't, you, man, can you imagine like that being the answer you want to give? I'm just feeling like, oh, I want to take the world on. Power, power. And then he shifts and he says, not just power, love. A spirit of love. Love's a hard one because our, our society uses love for everything, right? You love your wife and you love tacos and we don't see any difference between the two. Hopefully you do, hopefully you do. Um, <laughs> you're like, yes, tacos, stop it. Um, so one of the things I always like to do with words like this, I, I, try, to, I try to find maybe opposites, help me narrow down a little bit. Um, with this one, specifically when it comes to mental health, uh, how about the opposite of love being bitter? Bitter. Uh, I, I would say a huge part of people's mental unhealth comes from bitterness, from holding a grudge and not letting it go. That man, maybe, what if, what if that's messing you up way more than you think? 
Like you just think it's just some, well, you know, of course I'm mad about that still, but you don't realize how much this is messing with you. I mean, do you know research has shown that, that bitterness actually affects you physically? Like it, it, it causes your, uh, your blood pressure to go up and your heart rate to go up and causes uh, immune compromise. Bitterness actually makes you less able to fight off things with your body. Like research has shown that. And that's just the physical side. They've also uh, shown mental uh, side effects of bitterness being sleeplessness, fatigue, anxiety, depression, and if you need extra motivation, uh, a lack of libido. Forgive. <laughs> Forgive. What if that's a huge part of it? You're like wondering, oh, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What if one of the things is you just won't let go of some stuff? You won't let go of some stuff. You're going to have to forgive. You're going to have to release. And what that would do to you, the freedom that would cause mentally. What about this one? So yes, I think bitterness is an opposite. Uh, what about uh, being judgmental? What about being judgmental? Like not believing the best about others, believing the worst. Um, every single thing you see having a little comment in your own mind about it. Uh, how, do you, how do you scroll? What's, your, what's the spirit with which you scroll? Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, vacation again, hmm? Must be nice, must be nice. She's taking a lot of pictures without her husband. I wonder what that means. Do you do that? What kind, of, what kind of spirit do you have when it comes to that? Because this says that God gives us a spirit of love. And if you told me, if you came up to me and said, man, I, I spend a lot of time mentally nursing a grudge, uh, going over a past hurt in my head over and over again. I spend a lot of mental energy uh, kind of quietly judging everyone I interact with. Um, I would not then be surprised if you also told me, and I struggle a lot mentally. I don't feel mentally healthy. I would say, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you are. You're, you're, gonna, you're gonna have a hard time. But what if instead, what if, what if you went after the alternative? What if we leaned into this thing that evidently God's giving us? We just need to receive the spirit of love. It's the Greek word agape, very specific kind of love, unconditional love. Love that is, means you're not requiring anything of it to give it. You realize that? Unconditional love means you give it, you're not requiring anything back. You're not requiring them to reach some standard or not be some kind of thing. You're giving it freely. God level love. And what if, you, what if you asked God to give you that kind of love for the people in your life? Because like you're obviously aware you don't have that. So you gotta ask God to give it to you. So what, if, what, what would a vision where you had a spirit of love look like? What if you could say the sentence, you know one of the things I'm really good at? Forgiving. Can you imagine if like, that was like, on your list of things, like, hey, I'm really good at uh, you know, Texas Hold'em, I'm really good at baseball, and I'm really good at forgiving. Like, I, man, you could almost put, if you could say that, that would be like, for me, one of the ultimate flexes. I, I don't care about whatever else you would do. Be like, you know what, if you're good at forgiving, that's impressive. Think about that. What would it look like to be a person who's just like, man, I'm just really good at forgiving. I, just let, let's, I can just let stuff go. I can give it to God. I can forgive this person. doesn't mean I'm, there's a lot that goes into that, but I, I'm, I'm really good at it. I'm really good at forgiving. Can you imagine being that person? And then can you imagine being a person who's like not judgmental, where like your thoughts don't just go immediately to negative and angry and, and frustrated and, and envious Man, what would that look like? What would that do to your mental state? How much would that lift things? If you were a forgiver and you weren't judgmental of others, man, what would that do? What would that do to your relationships? What would that do to your life? So Paul says power, Paul says love, and then he says this word, sound mind. God has given you a sound mind. Now, I don't know about you, when I hear sound mind, I immediately just think like, well, what does that mean? Uh, that means just not crazy. <laughs> it doesn't that, that like he's like, oh, he did it in a sound mind. That means he like murdered the person knowing he was murdering the person. He wasn't crazy when he murdered the person. Like, that's what that sounds like to me. Like, oh good, God says we're not crazy. Um, 
But I actually think that the bar is a little higher than that. Um, this word carries the idea, the word sound mind carries the idea of being mentally disciplined. Mentally disciplined. Whew. Listen, there's lots of different kinds of discipline, right? There's disciplines to get up when your alarm goes off. There's discipline when you open up the refrigerator, right? There's discipline when it's supposed to be time to go work out. There's all different kinds of discipline, but this one specifically is, is disciplined here. Mental discipline. And I gotta say, I feel like this might be the hardest one. And you're like, really? The other ones sound hard. Yep, they're hard. This one's the hardest. This one's the hardest. So I've been pastor for almost 15 years. I've interacted with a lot of people. I've had a lot of like, so, 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 so many conversations with people. And um, I say, I'm not talking about you, not you, but like I've had conversations with people and I'm, the impression I've gotten is that a lot of Christians are um, mentally lazy, just really mentally lazy. And what I mean is like, they'll say stuff like, well, I just can't control my thoughts. <laughs> and I get it. I recognize nuance, so I'll tell you this. I do know there is a such thing as, as an intrusive thought, right? You have thoughts all the time that you didn't like try to think them, right? And those are weird thoughts too. Like sometimes you have an intrusive thought and you're like, am I a serial killer? Like, I don't know what this means. <laughs> like you actually think, like that's, that's a crazy thought to think. Why is that popping in your mind? And I, you can't control those ones, right? But what you do have control over is what happens next. The moment the thought shows up, then you have a choice. Are you going to keep the thought? I actually think that is the difference between you and a serial killer. It's not the intrusive thought. It's what you do with the intrusive thought, right? That's the big difference. Because that's the moment you have a choice. The thought's here. Now what are you going to do with it? Because what, what it means to have a sound mind is you can actually choose to say, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to think that thought. But most Christians act as if all thoughts are uncontrolled. Whatever happens in your mind, it just happens in your mind. And what you do is you allow an intrusive thought to become a, a thread of thoughts, which then becomes a train of thoughts, which then becomes a groove and a, and a way of thinking and a habit of thinking. And because you were undisciplined with the first one, now you've got a real problem. You've got a habit, a mental one. I think you have a choice when those thoughts pop in, of whether to let them stay or not. And I also think another thing that we do is that we seem to, like we can't tell the difference between a crappy day and uh, an undisciplined thought life. We can't tell the difference between the two. Because listen, there, the, this is an important distinction. There are, there are two, two things here. What happens to you and what you think about what happens to you. Those are, two, those are not the same thing. Those are two separate things. One you can't control, one you can control. You cannot control what happens to you every single day. Something could happen to you, this is out of your control. But you can control how you think about it. You can control all the thoughts that follow the circumstance. You can. So to, be, to have a sound mind means you are a master of your thoughts. Do you remember in the Psalms when David talks to himself? I think it's Psalm 42. David says, um, why are you downcast, O my soul? He's talking to his soul. He's like having a conversation. He's like, hey, he looks down inside himself. He notices something's off. He's like, hey, what are you doing? You ever have a feeling you know why you have a feeling? If you have a teenage daughter, you know. <laughs> why are you feeling feelings? We don't know. Um, I am pretty uh, stubborn about saying, hey, let's figure out where the feeling comes from. Because I like that David talked to himself. Hey, you're downcast, why? What do, what's this? Now, here's the crazy thing. You know what he says next? He says, why are you downcast? He asked the question. And then he says, I will put my hope in the Lord. It's like he's, his soul's trying to go one direction. He's like, hey, no, 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 come back this way. No, 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 we're not doing that. He actually actively talked to himself. Now, I'm not saying it like worked automatically like a, a light switch, but he's like, no, I'm not going to let you go that direction. I'm going to pull you back this direction. He talked to himself. He recognized his thoughts and his emotions were going in a direction, and he tried to turn them back the right way. He told his thoughts no. So let me ask you something. What do you spend more time doing? Do you spend more time listening to yourself or talking to yourself? Do you know what I'm saying, the difference? Uh, if you spend more time listening to yourself, it's a very passive thing. It's whatever comes, you're just letting that flow happen. Whatever intrusive thought comes, you let it happen. Whatever intrusive feeling comes, you just let it happen. If you're talking to yourself, every time a thought shows up, you're like, hold up a minute, why? What are you doing? I don't know if I want to keep you. Every time a feeling comes, you're like, hey, well, what's up with that? Hold on a minute. 
You're active. So you're, you're going to talk back. Uh, I would say it would be a, a much better mental thing if you talked to yourself more than you listened to yourself. Don't be passive in this. Be active. A sound mind means you can tell your mind no. Can you imagine, again, this is a vision. You're not supposed to feel guilty about this. This is a vision of what could be. Can you imagine having like a guard over your mind where every time a thought came in, the guard was like, hmm, no, you don't belong here and didn't let the thought stay. Oh, you're on the edge, but no. Okay, this thought's good. You can stay. Can you imagine having a guard over your mind where as those thoughts came in, it, it either let them stay or didn't let them stay? Whew. A sound mind. How many bad mental habits could you stop in their tracks before they ever started? All right, so look at the picture painted by just this one verse. Spirit of fear and uncertainty, out. Instead, we have a spirit of love, a spirit of power, and we have a sound mind. That's the first verse. You ready for the second one? Man, that was easy. Totally. Yeah, I got that. Check. Down. The well, second one's worse. Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep, talking to God, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Wow. Man, if I said that without a Bible verse, if I just said that sentence, some of you would be like, dude, that's, you can't say that. <laughs> right? That almost sounds like, just insensitive or, or like it's too good to be true a little bit. But here it is, written by Isaiah thousands of years ago under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaking to God, saying, God, you keep in perfect peace those who trust in you and whose thoughts are fixed on you. So there's an offer, and then there are two things that author is contingent upon, right? There's, there's an offer and two things that have to happen in order for you to actually accept the offer. It's if, if this, then that. And the that, the offer, is perfect peace. In the Hebrew, uh, the word shalom means peace, but here it's actually written twice. It's shalom, shalom. You will keep in, per, in shalom, shalom all who trust in you. It's not just peace, it's perfect peace. Peace, peace. Suggest a complete and total sense of well-being that transcends the mere absence of conflict. It's a holistic peace, including all of you, physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental. Peace, peace. Now, he gives you two things that this peace is contingent upon, right? Two things that have to happen. You have to trust in God and you have to have thoughts fixed on God, which is why this sound mind thing, this, this mental discipline is so important. You can't have the perfect peace if you don't have these other things. You have to have a fierce trust in God and you have to be able to fix your thoughts on God. So you have to do some work here. Instead of turmoil, instead of distress, instead of tension, instead of agitation, you can have peace. Can you imagine that? All-consuming, encompassing peace, a quiet mind, a healed mind. Get up in the morning and you're just like, okay, lay your head down on the pillow. All right, Lord, I'm going to go to sleep. You just go ahead and run the universe while I'm asleep. You got this, right? A stubborn trust that God is in control, that he loves you, that he loves the people in your life, that he's gonna ultimately work for your good and their good. Peace, peace, peace. Imagine that. Again, imagine, imagine what that would be like. You need to catch this vision of what could be. Again, somebody asking you the awkward question, how's your mental health? Can you imagine being able to answer, answer man, I'm just peaceful. I'm, I've got peace. Anybody who would answer like that, I'd be like, you need to tell me more about that. That, that sounds amazing. So look at this vision. Two verses, massive vision for your mental health. Spirit of fear, gone. Spirit of uncertainty and timidity, gone. Instead, we have a spirit of power. We have a spirit of love. We have a sound mind and we have perfect peace. This is the vision. This is what could be. Yes, you might be looking at it from a distance, but you need to see this. You need to let this crystallize in your mind, a vision. That's what God wants for your mental health. That's the picture. Now, uh, vision is really important. 
vision is really important, and I think it's important for two reasons. Uh, one, maybe you would have put yourself in the category of like, hey, my mental health's not great. I'm on a big, pretty big losing streak here. And maybe when you look around at the people in your life, maybe like your family of origin, you're like, yep, that's where I get it from. <laughs> it's not great. <laughs> and you don't have any like good examples there. And maybe even if you look around at people in your life, you're like, I don't really have a lot of good examples of this. The reason a vision is important is because you need to be able to see something other than what you know, maybe all you know is what you've experienced. And again, like a yacht club that's lost 132 years in a row, all they could ever imagine was what second place felt like. They didn't even allow themselves to think past that. They didn't know what it felt like, what it would be like to actually win. And what you need to do is allow yourself to imagine what it would be like not to be this anymore. You need to have a picture of it, uh, uh, some kind of idea of what this could be like, because you might not have any other great examples in your life. So allow these verses to give you this picture. Now, the second reason I think a vision is important. uh, So one of the pastors I listened to every once in a while was a guy named Andy Stanley. Um, If you don't like him, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Whatever. I mean, he's uh, an old pastor told me once, you can eat the fish and leave the bones. So if you don't like parts of what he says, he says some good stuff. Most of the time I listen to him, it's all in leadership stuff. He's really good at leadership stuff. And he says this one thing that's always in my head. And like half the time I hate it, half the time I love it, depending on my mood. Uh, and he says this, like, hey, if you don't know what to do as a leader, imagine what a good leader would do and do that. To which when I'm in a bad mood, I say, well, if I knew what a good leader would do, I would have already done it. <laughs> so shut up. Um, But it's actually an interesting exercise because what you really do, um, it allows you to kind of climb out of your situation, kind of jump off to the side and look at it from a different perspective. Like if I were, you know, if a great leader was me, what would they do? Um, And it kind of disconnects you from all your excuses and reasons for whatever you were doing at the time and you kind of can give yourself advice. Now, what really helps for me is when I imagine, because I know some good leaders, I imagine an actual person Like, what would this person do if they were in this situation? And it really helps me get some new insights. I can strangely give myself advice sometimes. So what if you, when it comes to your mental health, what if you ask the question, hey, what would a really mentally healthy person think right now? How would they be feeling right now? What would they be doing right now? What if you actually use that as kind of your, your, uh, one of the compasses that you, you start to see with here? make decisions with. And maybe, maybe it would be even better if you have somebody in your life. You're like, okay, this person, they kind of got it. What would they do? What would they be thinking? How would they be acting in this situation? Like get a picture of it. And, and the reason I like this is because you're not gonna, you're not gonna nail it. If it's been, a, if, you've, if, if all you've ever known is, is mental dysfunction, you're not gonna nail it out the gate. You're allowed to make mistakes. You're allowed to to take two steps forward and three steps back, but you at least have to have a direction that you're going. You at least have to have a vision for what it could be. So you need this vision. But this whole time I've been talking about this vision, presenting these things that could be for your mental health Some of you, as you've been listening to me describe this mental picture, you've been listening to it like you would listen to somebody who like won the lottery and they're like reading off the list of things that they bought with the lottery. If if you listen to a list like that, you'd be like, oh, that's cool for them. Never going to happen for me though. And you've been listening to everything I've been listing about mental health kind of like that from a distance nice for some people, maybe the super Christians and maybe a couple of really lucky people who've who've hit the mental lottery or whatever. It's not for me. I can't have that. And if that voice, if there's a voice in your head as I've been talking saying, that's not for me, I want you to know that is not God's voice. That's not God's voice. See, now I just want you to know, like, I don't think that, that mental health and, spirit, and your spiritual health are, exa- are the same thing. I think they're very related, but I don't think they're the same thing. But I will say this. If you've got a voice saying you can't have that, I think that comes from a pretty dark place. 
Because here's what, I'll tell you, if I were Satan and I was trying to, and I wanted you to stay mentally dysfunctional, I would convince you that you couldn't even have mental health because then I don't even have to fight you. You're never gonna go towards it because you've, you've, you've decided I'm here. This is where I am. This is where I was born. This is where I'm stuck. I'm never gonna have that. I'm here. He doesn't have to fight you then. You're just gonna stay here and he can just be like, good. The only way he has to fight you is if you believe it's possible. Believe that that's actually something God wants for you. Man, this is the part of the sermon I hate so much because I, I get to this point uh, where I wish I could like reach inside of you and, and flip a switch of belief to say, yes, I, can, I know that God can do that in my life. But I can't, I can't, I can't. Something has to, God has to move in your heart. I have to trust that God's gonna move in your heart and that, that, that a, a much better, louder, clearer voice can come over the top of that one where he says, no, I do want this for you, for you, for you. You have to hear that. So to, in an effort to convince you, be, be persuasive, I wanna... Um, show you the context of the two verses we just read briefly here. Uh, so when Paul wrote 2 Timothy 1.7, uh, do you know where he was? <laughs> so he's writing this, this letter to this young pastor who's out here and pa being a pastor is rough. I can, I can, I'm with Timothy. This is hard, okay? So he's trying to be a pastor. He's got all this stuff going on. And Paul's writing this letter to encourage him. Paul's writing, hey, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of, but of power and love and sound mind. From prison. From prison. And in Paul's mind, he's there to die. He's going to be executed. This is it. Writing, hey, Timmy, it's okay, buddy. God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. Like that sounds like the letter that Timothy should have wrote to Paul, right? Like, hey, it's you're in prison, Paul, buddy. Listen, like that should have been, but instead, Paul, who's in prison, is writing it to Timothy. And the reason I tell you this is not to give you some, well, you're not in prison, so you suck. Like, I'm not trying, you ever have people do that to you? Well, your situation is not about, I'm not doing that. What, I'm, what I want you to see is that it's possible. In the worst of situations, it's possible. And that verse in Isaiah, Isaiah 26, Isaiah's writing this, hey, God, you give, you give us access to this perfect peace if we trust in you and keep our thoughts fixed on you. Perfect peace. He's writing that in Jerusalem as the Assyrian army, which is the most powerful army on the planet, has set their sights on Jerusalem. And the most powerful army in the world is coming to attack their city. And Isaiah sits down and he's like, I think we can have perfect peace if we trust you and, and put our thoughts on you. And he hears the, <laughs> the door getting knocked down as he's writing this. In the middle of a war, Isaiah's writing about peace. And I, what I think that means for us is that the war doesn't have to be over for us to have the peace. That all the stuff can still be happening and there can be something here because your peace doesn't come from your circumstances. It comes from God. And again, this means it's possible. In the worst of circumstances, it's possible. No, no spirit of fear, no, no spirit of hesitancy, power, love, sound mind, perfect peace, prison, war, you can have it. You can have it. And maybe you're sitting here thinking, you know what though? Sounds impossible for me. You don't understand. And maybe I don't. I, I'm well aware that some of you have stories that you don't even share with people because it's so bad and you got a war going on here that I don't understand. Maybe the word you would use would be impossible. Well, let me show you one more verse. I'll end with this. Matthew 19, 26. This is Jesus speaking. He looked at them intently. This is not a, a, a side comment. He's like, hey, pay attention. He looks at them intently and he says, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. And maybe this is the verse you need to like write over your mental health. You feel like there's just no way. You feel like you're stuck. You feel like this is all you've ever known. It's 132 year losing streak. There's no way this is gonna be different. Maybe it is impossible with man, but with God, with God, he can do anything. He can do anything. Pray with me. Lord, I pray for the person who had that voice whispering in their ear the whole time, this, this isn't you. You can't have that. Lord, I pray that that voice would shut up. That you would silence it. 
that every person here would know that you can work. If you can heal blind eyes, if you can heal lame legs, you can heal someone's mental health. You can, you can, you can. I pray that they would know that, that they would know that, that they would know that. Lord, I pray for the person who's been stuck for a long time and it's hard to even have a vision for what this could look like. I pray that you would, you would begin to crystallize this, that you would begin to give them little flashes, little pictures of what mental health could look like in their life and that they would take steps towards that. Help them to see it, help them to be hungry for it. Help them to not settle for less than what you've given them. I know Satan's trying to get us to live beneath the potential you've given us, Lord, don't let him do it. Help us to not accept it. Help us to fight, to believe that better is possible, to believe that the impossible is possible with you. Fill us up, Lord. We need you, we need you, we need you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.